planning application. There are about 70 of these on the App Store and hundreds on the web, but none of them have any real traction. Uh, it's really weird. It's kind of an interesting part of the internet. Like none of these companies have any like a large user base. Because uh, it's a really interesting problem. Like the future is very uncertain. Um, so what I found out was that a lot of these have one thing in common. They focus on scheduling. So like picking a date and a time to spend time with somebody. But most people can use their calendar for that or texting. So I tried to create something that was not really a calendar and it's not really freeform messaging. It's kind of in between. So it's like a to-do list that's linked to other people. I'm gonna, I'm gonna show, you, show you right now. So I'm gonna log in. I use, it uses Facebook login um, for obvious purposes to have access to your friends. Now this is my table. It's like the main show. But I'm gonna, first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you how to make a new catch up. So I, I can just select from my Facebook friends here. I'm gonna pick my friend Arugolo. And I get a list of like common activities I can do with somebody or a large list of other activities. Or I can type in my own. So I'm just gonna type in miniature golf. And miniature golf. Now you'll notice this is a really key screen. There's no date attached to this screen. So like I said before, it's not about scheduling something. Like if you want to schedule something, you put it in your calendar or you can just text somebody and give me tomorrow. But I just want to send and receive intentions to do things with people. Just that's it. So let's send my intentions to play miniature golf with the below. Now if the internet can come through here, it'll Internet work. That was weird. Oh, let me check. That was strange. There we go. Now I have internet. Okay, so it was added to my table. And as you can see, like the, the seal is gray on the right-hand side. That means I sent my intentions to that person. But I also have a lot of red seals on the right-hand side. Every one of these activities, that person has like received my request and they've expl explicitly reciprocated the intent to do that activity with me. So they said, yes, I want to go to a movie with you. Yes, I want to paint with you. Okay? So now when I'm looking for something to do or for something to schedule, I have my to-do list that's linked to everyone else, that's stuff that they've already agreed to do with me, and I go, I go based on this, and then I'll text or call these people like I normally would. So, let's take a look at my inbox, which we can see that Arugula sent me one for a movie. I'm gonna click on it, and I could pass if I, if I don't wanna do it, but I'm gonna actually agree, because I think it sounds like fun. And that got added to, added to my table as well. Now, This activity, let's take a look, what I have, my options are. I can complete it as if I did it in the real world, but actually, if I can make these agreements, I should be able to break them. So I'm gonna, I can flake out if I want. I can be like, hey, uh, you know, I'm focusing on my relationship, and flake out. No internet connection. There we go. So it deleted off my list, but it also deleted off his list. So each person that has access to, to this item can delete it off both people's lists. So that just further emphasizes that every one of these is like a little mini open-ended contract to do an activity with somebody. Um, let's go into the miniature golf, the one that I made before. It's gray, which means there's no agreement yet, but that person was still notified, and this brings up a really interesting point. Ketchup doesn't have a two-way requirement, meaning I can download the application, and send out requests to my friends, even if they don't have the app. And they can agree with me on like a little HTML landing page that we made without them having to download the app. But even if they don't download it or even interact with me, I still notify them that I want to play miniature golf and I could mark it off on my own. So for me, it's like a to-do list where I can mark things off and it happens to be linked to my friends, whether or not they've had the app. So marking that is completed. I can share it on my social networks if I want. Um, but uh, I go to my account and I get like one point here for every time I do something with somebody. 
And, um, you know, I get a scrolling list of all the stuff I've done with my friends or some of the stuff that I plan to do with my friends ahead of time. It's pretty simple. That's catch-up. Uh, we launched on April 4th. We got 20,000 downloads. Uh, it was featured in New and Noteworthy out of the gate. It's still featured in the social networking category on the App Store. And it's a social to-do list. Thanks. How do you monetize? The question is, how do you monetize it? Um, it? That would come later on, like when we have a larger, much larger user base. But effectively, it's like Facebook. But Facebook knows you like this band, and they know you like another band, so they could give you an ad for a third band, right? So they're taking their your history, and they're selling you something based on predicting your future. But in this application, I have a list of what everyone wants to do ahead of time. So I can just have another section that provides deals and suggests venues and even sells goods to people. Like I know you want ping pong and billiards and drinks near you. You don't have to go search for all those things. You just have one feed of like content that advertisers want to be a part of. That's how it would be. Yes. I, I, I could only hang out with your, with your friends or can you just find strangers who have that interest? The question is, can you hang out with strangers? No, I mean, you can in real life, just you can't set it up with this. The idea is like, we want to stay away from networking, like business networking or like other kinds of like networking and, and stay away from dating. So effectively by having it built on Facebook, it's just already your Facebook friend, so you, you're probably gonna spend most of your time with those people anyways. So yeah, keep it to that. You said when we started up that there's a lot of staff going up towards none of them are gaining traction. The question is how uh, how is Ketchup different from all the other applications that are not gaining any traction on this App Store? Um, well, like I said before, all of them are focused on scheduling, which means like I try to send you, hey, let's go get drinks tomorrow at eight o'clock or whatever, or I try to get you you and I to compare our calendars. But really, people don't need an application for that. They just they just use free form communication like messaging or whatever. So I think what they can't do with those free form uh, messaging platforms is establish a bunch of connections and agreements with people so that, that are lasting and they stay there until they're completed. So, you know, people are making these types of arrangements already. They're saying, let's get drinks soon, you know, like let's play ping pong, whatever. Like, oh yeah, you gotta come to my house sometime. They're not ready to like schedule it. But if they captured those agreements as they went along, they would have a reference that was connected to other people, and that's why I think this is much different than the other ones out there. Yeah, well, we've seen so far that um, most people pick just hanging out because they. That, that's, I mean, like it's like hanging out, then drinks, and then dinner. Like it's kind of. Like, progression of like what people want to do and yeah we have like about 10% of our user base is logging in like on a weekly basis um, which is I don't know it's I don't know if that's good or not but I've heard that if you get 10% daily you're like killing it for a social application right? Go ahead. Are you, like, Oh uh, yeah, the question is how deep is the integration with Facebook in terms of sharing? Um, it doesn't automatically share what you do. We're, we're actually going to launch a new feature um, in like the next few weeks, which has like a news feed in the application where you can see your friends completed and agree complete, uh, completions and agreements in the app. But like right now, it's just an optional share to Facebook when you're done with something. Pulling from Facebook, okay. but I, you can actually like if if your friend doesn't have the application, you can pick them and then like you can deliver an SMS to them, being like, "Hey, I want to you know go go to the movies with you." Like, click you can click this link and agree with me, and it just goes to a little landing page. So in that essence, it's like very viral because I can just notify people and it notifies them about the application without them having to download it to use it. Speaking of morality, so 
how much are you seeing people who are getting sent messages and you're actually looking at this measure, but how many people are you seeing who get sent message are actually going into the app? Okay, the question is like how many how effective is the viral component? It's moderately effective. There's like a, I think about 15% of the people, or actually it's a pretty good rate of the people that click the agree button. And the little, like if I send you one that you don't have the app, you get a little landing page, there's a little, there's a little button. That button, that is like 40 to 50% of the time people click that. But the percentage time that they, you know, it's like a third of those people actually download the app. But like if I'm sending out multiple, then if, if I can get at least one other person to download it just by using it naturally, then then that, that's pretty viral. So we'll, we'll see how it goes. I mean, we had a pretty strong initial growth, but then, you know, as all things do, after the Apple feature, it's plateaued out. But we have a steady download of stream every day. So we'll see if it's going. Thank you, guys. We'll crush it if you open it up to strangers, mate. What? We'll crush it if you open it up to strangers. You'll have a much more viral uptake. Look at Tinder. Oh, you open it up to strangers, yeah. Um, today, please talk afterwards. This was great. Um, I'm sure a lot of people have more questions. So next, uh, we're going to see AHA Life. And did I say it right? AHA Life or AHA Life? What's the preferred? <laughs> AHA Life. Have you all used the online um, site yet? It's really fabulous. And I wanted to say, um, when I look through the demo applications for this particular meetup, I'm just starting to see an amazing trend in just phenomenal looking apps, great UX, and I think you're gonna see a really strong sampling of that tonight and you know already. So Aha Life um, here has Tej, who's head of business development, and also I wanted to introduce Art Chang, who's been involved in a meetup in the past, and he runs App Orchard, which actually builds out the mobile app. Um, and afterwards, I want Art to come up and maybe just mention the other app you released today for NYC government. Um, anyway, Tej. Thank you. Uh, so I'm Tej, um, head of marketing for um, AHA Life. Just a quick uh, show of hands. Is anyone from the press here? No bloggers? Uh, anyone? Uh, is it being recorded? Video recording? Okay, I'm already a lot of trouble for this. This is my first presentation for AHA Life. <laughs> <laughs> Our president, Stefano, came over here. He's not going to make it No, no, this is not from Stefano. This is from our branding director, what I can't see. <laughs> so I'm going to put that away. Um, give a simplified version. But, uh, this is what happens when you put an engineer in charge of marketing. So this is a simplified version. So people buy shit. We sell, sell shit really well. Uh, you're all recording it. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm doing this because we're going to take this to the office tomorrow. Right? Expensive. Expensive shit. Um, no, but seriously, uh, my name is Tesh. I'm the head of marketing for AHA Life. AHA Life is AHA Moment for Your Life. AHALife.com is the online destination to discover uh, the best the world has to offer. Um, our mission at AHA Life is to help people live their lives the fullest. Uh, we do this um, through two means. Our language right now is through content and commerce. We tell really amazing stories about really amazing objects from really amazing designers, really getting to fact of uh, who the person is, uh, how, who made the object, how they made it, and why it will improve your life. Uh, we're extremely excited to uh, debut the app um, you're the first people ever see it on a, on a public level, and personally, I'm extremely proud of it. It's uh, really part of our team for making it. Uh, it's, it's beautiful. Um, so, like I said, we, we do sell stuff on our site. We don't we don't consider ourselves an e-commerce company. We sometimes refer to ourselves as a curated marketplace um, for amazing items. With the app, we intentionally did not focus on commerce. Uh, the primary goal of the app was um, discovery and curation, um, and really driving engagement with the brand. Our target audience is a discerning consumer who's very conscious about what it is they purchase, 
Um, they love to be inspired, and they're the type of person that loves to have the story and the lessons behind the product and then share that with their friends. Um, the primary use case here would be someone at a doctor's office, subway, uh, ride, literally just being uh, pleased and surprised by what they find uh, in our app. So I'll just jump right into it. Um, I'm going to start quickly just by going over the gestures that we created. Top line navigation uh, for the application is what we call mood boards. These are multiple product collections tied together by a certain theme. So to browse between mood boards, swipe left and right. Uh, to dig deeper into a mood board, these are five different uh, collections. You will tap. And then to explore through it, I'll, I'll go through a, a single path uh, in detail. I just want to show you how it works. You know, you uh, swipe through, and if there's a product you like, sorry, in, in between each of the products uh, are little tidbits, content, information, tying the products together. And when you tap in, it gives you product detail. And again, if you wanted to purchase, you can. But again, that's not the primary goal of the app. So I will walk you through an actual uh, path that a user might go through. So again, these are the blue boards. Um, so this is a sort of stat ring by Rachel Roy and Deepak Chopra. You might learn from this that you know already, so who is a Japanese ritual of suicide? Um, this one is the following, the short sword, reserved only for samurai. Um, stuff like that you'll find throughout the app. You'll also find different surprises and uh, Easter eggs, again, if you want to break into it. That's a tie between you know, the sword, jewelry, and uh, tea, which also then ties into our next product, uh, Deepak Chopra. As Japanese products first began making matcha over a thousand years ago, so you know, the black center meditation, which ties the previous product into this, and then you know, just wanting to show you a little bit of a surprise throughout. I don't want to go away too much of the app, but as you spend time with it between different products, we have different elements. Uh, so for example, you can actually call the Bob Chopra.
think you just see me double click with me. No, I saw that. I saw that. But, uh, but I think that it's working on like more of the Yeah, absolutely. So we are working out. Just give you uh, a little bit of background. Aho Life has been around about two and a half years. Um, Stefano, our president, joined about nine months ago. I joined about five months ago. One of our big efforts was we launched a new version of the site two weeks ago. And mobile optimized version is currently in our uh, roadmap. Uh, you'll see this, and you won't find this in the app search yet. You'll find it in a couple of weeks, and in that time, it's really important. So you guys are really the first to see it. Yeah, I was trying to do a slide of hand quickly there. <laughs> but we, we know that's a big issue for us. Yeah. Michael? It's in review. Yeah, I think we're shooting for June 11th right now. At least that's what we're scheduling all our marketing. Yeah. Are you guys making money? As a company? Yeah. Online? Yeah. This is really our first foray into mobile. We actually know we, we have made money on mobile. Not through this app yet. Yeah, so prior to the uh, prior to the mobile app, we did have the AHA 1.0 site, uh, which was a mobile optimized experience. And as we push into the 2.0 platform, um, we were looking to build an application that was going to do a lot more around discovery. And then eventually we'll figure out whether we want to move to more web for commerce or build a brand yeah. or make it more of a tablet based experience. Uh -oh. You should go next, but I want to just insert what about the point that you made that the intention is not necessarily to drive major revenue directly from humans through mobile, but um, going back to the last event we had, we had a mobile commerce event with um, several big retailers as well as skilled and all of them were kind of speaking uh, or backing up an article that was in the Times in December or January, just saying that you know in many many cases companies are not seeing direct revenues from mobile, but they are seeing um, revenues from on online impacted by mobile because people are setting up wish lists, getting more attention to the brand, getting fed um, more targeted content. So. Yeah, and also, just from a, a business case standpoint, the, the types of products we're selling, we're not selling uh, iPhone 5 VJ adapters, uh, or at least not, not something transactional that you would think to go to Google or Amazon for. These are high-end products that you discover, and there's a very strong emotional tie to it. So what we're doing here is actually has not been done online, or at least not done well. We don't offer deep discounts. We're not a flash sale site. We're really trying to replicate that emotional attachment to uh, why a product's made and why you need it. And that's really what we're going for here. Let's do one more question. So just so I'm clear, on the mobile app, you can actually buy stuff on it? Yeah, so again, that's not the intention of the mobile app, but if you wanted to, when I went to that product page, which you so assume you saw that it wasn't mobile optimized, if you wanted to purchase, you actually could actually make a purchase. It would be like going to the mobile app. What's a good segue for you to? Yeah. And so, again, this is Arch Ching, your runs at Orchard. Thanks, thanks, everybody. Um, so, anyways, it's a real pleasure to be here. And most importantly, it's a pleasure to work as a partner with uh, Hall Life. And the, the thing that's, that's, that's interesting about this is when you extract the minimal viable product, we really focus on this idea that the brand is the most important thing engagement but to really get this, to nail what the user discovery process really is about. So when we think about what success is for this app, it's not clicking on the, the mobile commerce site, but it's actually being able to sustain people in their exploration on this app, going from going through the stories, going through the news stories, and being able to entertain somebody for hours. Now there's there's a there's a, also a strategic relationship here, which is that there's, the Hot Life was pursuing a rebuild in the back end, and this has resulted in their new website. And so, from a risk perspective, we want to be able to couple the two things. And so, the first place to go is really the user engagement piece, because that's really the most important piece of the business. The second part is then to be able to kind of tie back into the user identity, be able to do personalization, be able to save items, be able to build up a portfolio of things that really matter to the user, then use those engagement metrics as a way to really define 
the inputs into the product strategy as you go along. So it allows us to iterate in a very data-driven, metrics-oriented kind of way about the product that will ultimately benefit from the website, as well as start to bring, sort of narrow the gap between the web and the mobile product. I, I'm sorry, I want, I need to please ask the question afterwards, please stay and talk, but I do want, our, can you just speak a little bit to the um, tool that was released in Newsmarket? Uh, to uh, at Orchard Design, the New York City Campaign Finance Board's new candidate contribution tool on mobile. Please, would you speak two minutes or so, and then we'll send around an announcement when it comes out. Thanks. Um, so I wear a number of hats. So in, an, in, another, in, a, in another part of my current life, I'm a one of the four board members of the New York City Campaign Finance Board, which runs the largest matching funds program for candidates for public office. Um, I'm also a chair of the Voter Assistance Advisory Committee, which is tasked with increasing civic engagement in New York City elections. And we ask ourselves a few basic questions: is that why is it that people have access to technologically-based tools that give them great power in their lives, such as Amazon and Twitter and Facebook and others. And second, why not Why why not create something? Like, no, why not give people in their interface between democracy and their regular lives access to those tools? And the third thing is we said, well, what if you could actually bring those things to life? And so we, we pulled together um, you know, a, a public-private coalition of technologists, designers, social media marketers, and others. About $2 million of pro bono work went into a project called NYC Votes. The first piece of it was released, um, launched today, and it's designed for the professional campaigners, designed for candidates, contributors, and their They really understood their customers across channels, and it's kind of blown up a little bit since then because now we're focusing more on just a lot of different verticals beyond retail, like automotive and financial with like retail banking branches and um, entertainment. And really, it's gone past retail to anyone that owns a brick and mortar location, really any business. But uh, what we started with was a basic in-store analytics platform that would live on top of a Wi-Fi router that could detect anonymous cell phone signals. And so that's how it impacts mobile. So you're probably wondering why I'm showing you a desktop version, but uh, what it does is it takes any anonymous signal coming off the Wi-Fi chip on a smartphone, and it can detect the signal strength, it can detect the MAC ID on the phone, which is the unique but anonymous you know, 16-digit number, and then it can detect the timestamp of the ping. And so if you have an active session on your phone, it can actually, like your phone's actually sending out a signal all the time, looking for networks to connect to if it has Wi-Fi turned on. And so all we're doing is putting a Wi-Fi router that's inside of a store into listening mode so that it will just hear all the signals coming off every ambient device that enters the location with Wi-Fi turned on. And so what we have here is what you would get you know, when that goes through our pipes and then it comes out on the other end, which is basically a really interactive, real-time you know, analytics platform for any physical storefront. So, Things like window conversion, which is basically what percentage of people walking by on the street every day actually enter your store. Duration, how long do people stay in the store once they've walked in. Frequency, what percentage of your customers walking in are new versus repeat. Popular device type, so you can actually get down to, you can do it by OS or you can do it by manufacturer, and that's all based on that Mac ID on the phone. Cross-store behavior, so if you have our sensors up and running in multiple locations within a chain, you can actually see what percentage of people coming in have been into two stores, three stores, four, et cetera, et cetera, you know, within your chain. And then if we integrate with your POS systems, we can actually serve up sales data against all these numbers so you can start to do correlations and actually figure out, you know, what, which of these trends, you know, mean something for the bottom line. Um, and then what we really started to get into was we started to see our devices really get popular within, first in New York and then, you know, outside of New York and other big cities as we've signed more and more retailers. And then we realized that it would make our lives a lot easier if we started to integrate with existing routers, like Cisco, Aruba, Meraki, Motorola, et cetera. And so when we started integrating with them, since a lot of retailers have already invested a lot of money in you know, their existing infrastructure, since a lot of them will provide guest Wi-Fi and a lot of them will provide you know, connectivity for mobile iPad, you know, POS, and all that kind of stuff, we started to get more cool data, like 
Wi-Fi connection rate. So maybe what percentage of people who walk in actually connect to your guest Wi-Fi? Or once they're on the Wi-Fi, what in aggregate, not ever individually because we want to protect privacy, but in aggregate, are they looking on Amazon? Are they looking at your store's website? Like what are they doing in terms of their search box? Um, recency, so you know, if you look at average consistency of visit among your customer base, what percentage are visiting more in a more active sense than not? And then things like you know, walk by conversion, so does your average new customer, how many times do they pass by the store before the first time they ever came in? Or once they've been in the store for the first time, then how often do they pass by you know, compared to coming in? So there's just a lot of really cool infographics here, and that's just phase one. And we're working with about 25 major retailers currently on this product. And then you know, some of the other stuff that is being basically rolled out as we speak is more of a measurement platform where you can start to tie it up against you know, data and do comparisons and start to look at it on a map basis start to look at it on a trend basis if you're doing comparisons between different locations, start to do it on just a pure kind of you know textual basis if you're looking to run numbers, and then ultimately even get into engagement where once people have opted in, you could actually start to tie their identity to their profile within the store. So, and this is purely based on opt-in. So imagine someone using an app, like an iPhone app of the retail, like Sephora app or Burberry app, or actually going one step further and doing it within the guest Wi-Fi network where if their device is actually connected to the access point in the store, they could, like the splash page you would typically see on like Starbucks, you know, Wi-Fi, if you actually put in your email address while you were on the network, you could also tie your email to your device ID that way. And once you've done that, imagine being able to have a full profile of the customer because they've opted in and they want you to know them when they walk in the store. That's why we named the company Know Me, so that you could know me when I walk in. Um, so anyway, that's a really quick over. I could go on this for an hour, but uh, any questions? Thank you. Wow. <laughs> you want to pick? Um, please. Uh, what sort of incentives would a user have to go it's, it's really roll your own. So a lot of all this information is all just based on us integrating with an existing retailer system. So in some cases it would be their e-commerce platform, in some cases it would be their CRM. All this stuff is based on, like we would provide the in-store data, because that's where we serve up you know, the data, and the messaging data, because we are planning to do something where we might push out notifications through an app. But everything else would be on us pulling data once we've got that customer record completed. So the incentives would be based on each retailer, like they would roll their own. So for support it might be, hey, you know, you're already a member of Beauty Insider program, do you want to get an additional offer or inventory alerts when you walk in? You know, but imagine that in an appropriate fashion for every single retailer. Can I share with you? Yeah. So I, I've had a little bit of experience working with retailers, maybe more in the grocery store space. Sure. Or more in the retail space. And um, Well, that stuff is all on the way. So this, like these last few slides, have been mockups. Um, so the analytics and the measurement components are what are live now. And so a lot of this is purely based on integration. So we do have pilot customers who are beta testing this as we speak, but it's not a fully baked, rolled out product yet. So uh, can you can you track down to an individual even if they don't opt in for uh, things like? You know, you push an ad to the person, hey, you would just walk by my store. No, no, because we don't know, like we don't have any way, first of all, there's two reasons. One, we don't have the mechanism to actually deliver the push through you unless we have an app on your phone or integrated to an okay. app. And two, we have no idea who you are until you basically raise your hand and say you're a loyal customer. So everything's so, a aggregated until yep. that point. Yeah, it's the same way as like, you know, if you use Gmail and you go to like Drudge Report and ESPN and, you know, CNN, you're still gonna get like relevant content even though you've never actually raised your hand and said who you were. Same kind of thing. And three, uh, if they hadn't done the privacy disclosure, right. then you've done another way. Exactly. Yep. Have you, has this layer live on the router? Is it like the same thing cloud or do you actually? Yeah, this is all cloud based. And so, regardless of whether it's our device or an integration with you know a third party hardware manufacturer, 
we need something in the store actually sending us the data, and then we parse the data with our own algorithms and machine learning, and then you know serve it up to the cloud. And they can get it on their phone, on their tablet, or on desktop. If you, just, if you can tell me, what do you use exactly to, to figure out anonymous individuals? Like, to figure out individuals anonymously? Like, you buy ID now? Uh, Mac ID. So it's the it's the Wi-Fi specific ID. So we're just we're only sniffing the Wi-Fi chip on the phone. So we're only capturing about 50% of the audience that will walk into a store because you know there's a percentage of people who have a smartphone and then there's a percentage of those who would have Wi-Fi turned on. Right. Is there, are you guys looking for any kind of solution that would use the the, uh, use the uh, cell phone network? Yeah, we're open to. We've we've been talking to all the big guys like AT&T and Verizon and others, but. You know, the more if there's a if there's a custom made pre baked version that uh, you know would pull in three G four G data to help complement this would be definitely open to it. So we can talk afterwards. Anyway, thanks guys. Okay, thank you. Um, so up next we have Problemio, and I thought this was interesting because this is Alex. Gnadnik, and he um, has actually produced uh, business advice apps in sets. So he has a set of four apps that offer business advice, and it's been written up quite heavily because there have been significant numbers of downloads, 150,000 um, of his apps. And so great to have you, and why don't you just speak a little bit to the app and what's going on? Hi, everyone. Thank you, Amanda. Um, so yes, my name is Alex Kinadinik, and I made a number of business apps. Originally, I made one business app, and people just really liked it. Uh, for a while, it was the highest rated business app on Android, period. It was like 4.8 or something, like real reviews. Um, and then I, no and I noticed people making the same mistakes all the time. Issues with business ideas, business planning, marketing, and fundraising. Uh, so I started. A, so I made a four-app course to take people from business idea stage, sometimes pre-business idea, to operational. Uh, and the app helps people uh, helps take the person through that journey. Uh, the, app, the, the app does that in, in three distinct ways. Precisely because most entrepreneurs are first-time entrepreneurs, there is a very heavy educational section. Uh, here you can see uh, we're in the planning business, a little bit of a timeline for starting a business, what to do, um, learn to raise money, from loan to grants, uh, crowdfunding, investment, uh, how to create your website in a couple of days, how to market it. Uh, why am I doing this? What I can be doing it here. So, uh, where was that? So, the content, the educational content, isn't exciting for you guys because you want to see something interactive, but I just want to emphasize that it's very important because uh, since so many people downloaded the apps and there's been about 15,000 people who actually plan uh, business, their businesses on this thing, uh, every time someone uh, comes across an issue, uh, it gets put back into the content, it gets put back into the article. So probably if you're starting a business, uh, any issue you're facing, very likely it's here. Uh, so, but the app also helps by uh, <coughs> by connecting you to expert help. Uh, so you can ask questions, uh, and that's probably the best part of the app because there's nothing like that. Um, there's nothing like getting built through there. And the feature that I'm going to show you today uh, is the group planning. So let's say you have co-founders, advisors, uh, I'm not going to plan the business now, I, I'm going to show you a pre-planned one. So your business plans, and then yet another social photo app, right? We'll go there, and uh, yeah. uh, um, uh, and then you see there, there are the sections of a typical business plan. Even, I even put in a few more just to help guide people. This is not, this isn't too much. This is like, when I think of this app, I think about educating the person and empowering them. So some of these things aren't strict business plan things, but they are things people, I try to make people think. Um, 
And then what you can do is you can uh, play with friends. Basically invite friends. And the way it will work is uh, you can have a conversation ongoing here. Like I invited some friends. And you can see there's anyone you know their business app, another social sharing app, and blah, 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 blah. So basically you can actually switch. You, you basically uh, plan it together with your team on this thing. And then, uh, yeah, and you basically go and through things uh, on the go. So you don't even have to start with a computer, not touch with a computer. Um, How is there any trend in the yeah, I was really surprised. I thought most people would be doing like apps and websites and things like that, but I think the reality of it is that it's, uh, I think we are in a place where we just have such a biased view. Most of the world, every city in the world needs laundry mats, restaurants, uh, lawn care, uh, all the local right. dentist offices. So don't like uh, local service is huge. Like it makes me, it made me really think about the value of Yelp and businesses who cater to local services. It's very like very few people um, actually want to create apps. Uh, I don't know why I thought. More to do. And an interesting thing, like people overseas, they have really wild ideas. Um, like you know, in the U.S., it's common. It's like your local, your common local service. It's like your some people do want to make websites, but like if you go to Africa or India, they want to make factories and plants and ship, and they want to build. It's very different, and they're like, I want to start a purifying water plant. Okay, so I I don't know if it's whether they don't want that those particular people don't have the experience and that just require too much money, or, but but that's what I'm sort of seeing. Well, first of all, thank you. Uh, if you search in, the, in either Android or iOS for Problemio, pro, pro you'll find all of my apps. Problemio, Problemio. Yeah. Uh, there are some free apps. They're not. They're not that good. Uh, except like on Android, I have a good free app. But uh, the only good ones on iOS are paid. Sorry. But this kind of name. It's kind of business find out. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this is the second app in the app course. And yeah, it's available on iOS, Android, Kindle, and the Note. Yes. Um, what were some of the insights that led you to decide to create an app for this versus you know, doing a website or a good uh, To be honest, at first, I was just able to get a lot of distribution uh, in the App Store. Like on Android, I ranked number one for like everything. Business, um, so that was, it was just easy um, on the web. Uh, but also, I think a, a lot of people they know they, they tell me that it's it's really convenient for them to have it on the go, and they like the short form of it. Um, people don't really write a lot, but it's like um, they just whenever they have an idea, they um, they use it. Okay. It's not very templates, like like a marketing plan typically there's a template. Yeah, the marketing app, you have a marketing plan template, it will sort of like, you know, how big is like how how does your it, it asks you sort of like actually I like the marketing app template because uh, most people get it totally wrong. Uh, like most people's initial conception of marketing is business cards, flyers, and what they did. So I was able to I was trying to make I was I made it so that you know what are you gonna do Facebook, you know. So it kind of asks you like these sections. That app asks you like, are you going to reach your target audience at what scale, uh, at what cost? You know, so you can really have a complete marketing plan actually. Um, and on all these things, you can do collaboratively and with someone. So if you don't really know the answer, and the fundraising app as well, that has you know section for how you're going to raise money with loans, donations, investments. So you separate it all and. Um, and also guides you to understand how much money you need to raise. Um, well, we're going to start it on Android. I'm, these are very dominant on Android. Um, and I'm, I'm a little bit myself. I had to make all of myself. So uh, I'm a, I, I dove into iOS later. So iOS are a little bit 
Uh, I think there's. Any yeah, yeah. Is it like fully sync collaborative, or is like you emailing back, you just messaging each other back and forth or each time? Uh, what do you mean by fully sync? I mean, like the Google Docs is for everybody. Oh uh, yeah, I mean it's in the cloud, so. What's that? I mean it's in the cloud, so it's like. So you're just like <coughs> like a version control of the file that you both have. Kind of. I mean it's, it's in the database, but. And uh, whoever shows that download the app gets a few t-shirts. Thank you. So I just wanted to say, and, and I hope um, this is okay for me to say to an audience, but I I, I think that you know maybe the strongest this I, I think there are a lot of kind of hidden gems in this app, and I think some of it's just evidenced in the number of downloads. I think it's probably safe to say maybe your UX isn't the strongest part of the app, and. Um, well, but actually, the UI is really good. The US, uh, is actually, well, you know, it's not for me to say, but um, the users love it. Um, it's the highest, it's doing the highest rated app. Yeah, so I think, you know, especially in this room, people who are interested in maybe talking to Scott, to Alex about, um, you know, gamification, how to kind of bring those elements, maybe UX, designed things into this that could make it even stronger. I, I, I think that, I think there's something, there's some big opportunity with this. So I, I just wanted to make sure people saw that because you're right, it's not, you know, it's not speaking to business as people in this room and often in the tech and New York bubble really think of business. Um, and, and clearly there's a market for this kind of advice and ways of thinking about business plans out in the US and in the world. So, um, this is Scott Lindenbaum. Did I pronounce your name right? Because yeah, I'm sorry, I slaughtered Alex's. Um, and he's presenting Spun. And Spun is another phenomenal UX, um, bringing some of the best content from you know, publications um, in the US to uh, users based on their preferences, on their location. And I'll stop there and let you take over. I think Alex actually made a really good point, which um, is going to be relevant when I launch Spun, uh, which is right here. Um, he was saying how uh, his app, um, actually user experience isn't um, the issue that was being referred to, right? Because the users, yeah, it's a question of UX versus UI, and I think that is really important um, to keep the two separate, right? Because um, user experience has, of course, more to do with um, people's ability to understand what's going on, to flow through the application, to be successful uh, in completing whatever it is you're designing for, uh, versus the look, right, and the actual interface. And the reason I bring it up is because um, I'm going to show you an app that, uh, whose development has been predominantly driven by trying to create an incredibly pleasant user experience. Um, so this is Spun. We're launching this version on Thursday. So if you download it from the App Store, you'll see the previous version. Um, you can see that uh, it doesn't really load like most other apps. It's a 3D spinning cube that comes flying at you from outer space, um, which is kind of cool. And um, it's also rendered in 3D this way um, and this way. Which is cool. So the idea here, um, it's obviously it's news, right? You can recognize The Onion or Time Magazine or The Telegraph, right? So these are articles that we're pulling from all over the place. Um, but the idea here was to make something that is incredibly fun to play with. Um, we wanted to conceive of Spun as an object in 3D space um, that you can manipulate. And that was um, kind of brought into our heads by some of our contacts at Apple, who we worked with on the first version. Um, who said, like, you really have to court the gesture. You know, the, the whole um, kind of point of this phone is that you gesture on it. Um, and that's what makes it different from, like, a laptop or something like Google Glass, right? Um, and so you want to make people want to touch it and just play with it. Before they even know what it does, they should have a good time just spinning it around and whatever. So um, it's an aggregation of articles. Uh, our backend monitors about 10,000 different websites. It can see when an article is trending within a niche community relative to the other articles in that community. So for example, uh, film buffs might be sharing something to Facebook or Twitter to the tune of like 100 shares, but in their community that might be twice the average, right? Whereas the New York Times 
getting 100 shares would be a very unsuccessful article, right? So we're able to kind of flag these things in the millions of articles we're monitoring. Plus we have an editorial team who uses some good old fashioned kind of editorial judgment. And uh, we program spun. And then when you see something that looks interesting to you, um, you tap into it and it splits in half, uh, which is pretty cool. There we go. Um, and then it shows you the article. And you can see here it's in readable view. Um, you can read it offline, you can read it online, and you can go to the next article, right? Or you can go back to the queue and split open a different one. But uh, if it's a local article, uh, so it'll know if you're in New York, and it'll serve you a blend of articles that aren't just the kind of best of the web or the trending stuff on the web, but uh, also stuff that's relevant to where you live. So if you're in New York, San Francisco, Chicago, Boston, LA, Seattle, Portland, DC, or Austin, um, you will also get local content. And uh, in this case, we're talking about six ice cream companies that you should visit this summer. Obviously, it's local, it's relevant to the time of year. It's from Brooklyn Magazine, which you might not check every day, but probably has a good article you'd be interested in on a regular basis. You can also tap into the map, and you can see we've also mapped all the different ice cream spots in the article. So what we try to do with local content is really spatialize it, so that your experience of reading on Spun which is mobile, right, which may demand that you're out in the world and that you want to do things out in the world is a little bit different from just going to Brooklyn Magazine's website. We add a little bit of value. Um, we try to make sure that every single thing you can do on this app, even though effectively you're just um, searching for content and reading it, um, popping it open and reading it, we make sure that every little gesture you do is kind of designed, um, in a way it's kind of hyper-designed, uh, so that it feels like something you haven't seen before. So for example, if you want to favorite an article for later, tap the little heart, you get a nice little blooming animation. If you want to share something, you actually unfold the share sheet uh, from the bottom right, which is pretty cool. Um, so we tried to make everything the kind of thing that when you see it for the first time, you want to do it again, right? So like when I opened up the share sheet, like someone over there said, oh, interesting, right? So the idea here is to get you to then close it and then open it again, and then close it and then open it again. Um, just like when you go into an article, and you're like, oh, that was cool, the screen kind of did some weird thing, so I'm going to open it again, I'm going to go back, I'm going to go forward. Um, the reason that's really important is because I did a little bit of study with this guy at Stanford named BJ Fogg with two Gs, who you should look up if you're designing things. Um, he uh, marries ideas of behavioral psychology with user experience design. And the bottom line is we're all designing for behaviors. Right? So when you download Spun, what do I want you to do? Like on a micro level, what I want you to do is open an article and read it, right? Because if by opening an article and reading it, you have a good experience, then you're more likely to open another article and read that, right? And once you design for a particular behavior, make it cognitively and physically simple, you can get people to do it again and again over a certain period of time, right? Which we call re-engagement, right? That you were talking about before. And eventually behaviors become chunks psychologically and they become habits. Right, so he mentored the guys from Instagram. It turns out it takes about two weeks of using Instagram before it's a habit, meaning you'll open it, um, not to take a picture or with any specific intention, but just because it's your habit to open it. Same way that you would brush your teeth. So uh, by designing an app where every gesture has a kind of little visual or auditory, even though I don't have the sound on, reward, um, we get people in the habit of doing this behaviors, right, over and over and over again. So if it's fun to hit the share button, you're likely to hit it more often. The more often you hit it, the more likely you are to share more often. So this is kind of how user experience design kind of dovetails with what we decided to do. Um, at the end of the day, the reason people will continue to use Spun and have continued to use it, we launched version 1.0 in November, um, is because there's just too much content on the web. Um, you know, the average user only goes to maybe eight websites, um, just like user of the internet. And of course you can name like three of them, right? Like Facebook, Google, and Wikipedia, so now you've only got five left. Um, so the idea here is to make discovery easier. And this is kind of what I'm going to leave you guys with before questions. Um, there is so much content and so much of it that you miss that you would love. So the real underlying kind of goal of Spun and the Spun team is to make it easier for you to discover great content that you would have otherwise missed. And when we poll our users, about 85% of them say that that's what they like best about Spun, is they see articles that they wouldn't see elsewhere that they're interested in. So that's fun. Um, you can ask me anything you want. If you download it, you'll get the update on Thursday. Um, and we're hoping that it will be prominently featured in the app store.
Oh, yeah, sure. Um, as far as re-engagement is concerned, that 10% number is totally accurate. Um, um, Fred Wilson from Union Square Ventures, who's like a good barometer of these things, says that if you're getting 10% daily re-engagement for a uh, consumer-facing app, uh, you're doing great. Um, we're seeing, the, the cool part about Spun uh, is that for version 1.0, we're seeing 33% daily re-engagement um, in our core markets, right? So version 1.0 uh, only was targeted at New York, San Francisco, Chicago, and those other cities. Whereas 2.0 also rolls in content that's not city specific for users outside of those cities. So in version 1.0, we saw 33% of the overall user base use it every day. Um, that was after iterating, right? We put out about five point updates to get there. So we now have what we would call like a good product market fit, and now it's a question of scale. Uh, right now we're running about 80,000 downloads. Anyone else? Yeah, uh, just a techie question. Uh, what uh, part of the iOS stack do you use to implement that? Is it core animation? Uh, you know, okay, so there's this guy, Peter Grace, that works for me, who built all the 3D stuff. Um, it's all built completely from scratch. It doesn't use OpenGL or anything like that. Um, he is actually, and it's actually, when you load it, the stories you see spinning in, it's not a, like a fake animation. Those are actual views being rendered in 3D space. So it'll look different every time based on the stories that are on the cube. What's actually happening is four views are being simultaneously rendered and mapped along an X, Y, and a Z coordinate. Uh, it's terribly complicated, and he's hoping we never had a fifth side. <laughs> yes? Uh, yeah, yeah, so the question is like, uh, can similar content continue to arrive, right? Yeah, so we uh, monitor everything you do, everything is catalog, meta tag, everything else on the back end. The more you engage with sports stories, the more often you see them. Uh, the more you uh, don't engage over time with food stories, the less often you see them. And in the update we're putting out in about a month, you'll also be able to artificially tag categories as being of interest to you. So you'll be able to say, let me start, start sports as like plus 25. And then over time, your behavior will kind of tweak that. Uh, one more? Sure. One, okay. Uh, who has the best question? <laughs> Seriously, a real question. All right. Um, question. Yeah. Uh huh. Oh, just the money just flies out of the air magically. Yeah. Um, so uh, basically, that's part of what we built. Is a magic money air shooter. Um, no. So. Uh, we make no, almost no money now. Um, we're just trying to scale users and be like a really great news experience. However, we have made some money um, in order to show that we will be able to make more money later. Uh, the way we're doing that is by working with publishers and brands to feature certain content on certain days. So for example, if you were using the app over the course of the last week, you might have seen a little piece about the Hangover 3 uh, and a trailer with like a little two paragraph article or The Great Gatsby, or next week you'll see The Man of Steel. Um, we're working with Warner Brothers to put those in there and they say sponsored by Warner Brothers at the bottom. So the idea here is that um, banner ads on mobile are junk, um, but placed content that is actually relevant to your interests as like a moviegoer is not junk. Um, and you know it's sponsored, we know it's sponsored, but the reality is maybe you haven't seen the new Man of Steel trailer and you'd like to. So um, we're gonna be doing that a little bit more. We just partnered with Thrillist uh, and we're working on a partnership with Time Inc. to do similar things. Um, I also want to add to that, um, BJ Fogg, who Scott mentioned, actually it really is worth looking up if you want to back it. It was very interesting when he brought um, his name up when um, Scott and I initially spoke. He does a lot in behavior change psychology and as it relates to technology. And I actually worked with him on texting um, as it relates to behavior change. So it, it's really amazing what this man is studying and helping his students and followers apply. So definitely look him up. And this is Roger, sorry. <laughs> this is Roger. Roger and Daphne are here from Refundo. Um, Daphne, where are you? Um, hello. And Refundo is one of um, several really exciting um, financial apps in coming up, uh, financial startups coming up in New York, specifically targeting unbanked and underserved 
um, people in the finance world. So um, I don't know if you're following this in tech, but the White House, um, many branches of US government are working on ways to use mobile to help underbanked people really get their financial education and financial resources. So we're excited to, to have you present. And here's Rupendo. Hi guys, come on. So my name is Roger, and like she said, my, uh, we're with Refundo. And when we first started Refundo, our goal was to help people get their tax refund faster than an IRS mail check, which takes about four to five weeks. So we were dealing uh, with the underbanked population, and in the United States, it's only 68 million people who are financially underserved. This means that they either don't have a bank account, or if they do have a bank account, they don't use it for all of its purposes. So people would receive this IRS mail check, and then they would take it to the local check cashier, and they would forfeit hundreds of dollars just to receive their tax refund. Remember, these are the people that need it the most, giving up hundreds of dollars just to have access to their tax refund. So what Refundo does is it allows tax professionals to open up bank accounts for their customers right on the spot when they're going to prepare the tax returns. It can be used by small companies as well as large franchises. So the customer can now benefit from IRS direct deposit. So they receive their direct deposit into a bank account that we open for the customer. And now they have, instead of waiting four to five weeks, they only have to wait four to five days. And we decided that the technology and the banking relationships that we have developed over the course of, uh, the course that we started the fund though, can be used by anybody really. Why not open a bank account for anyone whenever they want? So that's what I want to show, share with you guys today is the Refundo mobile app. It's now available on the App Store. And the goal is, uh, to be able to open up a bank account right from your phone, right work from where you are right now, you can open up a fully FDIC insured bank account right on your phone. So I want to show you that. So once you log in, you enter a mobile pin, and this bank account is uh, linked either to a MasterCard or a Visa, and you can see some of your spending here. So it's spending in real time. So as soon as you swipe your card, immediately the transaction will pop up on your, on your mobile device. And you can go to any one of these transactions, and it'll tell you where that transaction took place. It'll give you your balance, your running balance on the bottom right, uh, and it'll also tell you how much money you spent. You can add comments to these transactions. So you can write something in here like, uh, you had uh, number six, which is my favorite thing at Wendy's. And whenever I want to go back into that transaction later on, I'm searching for my transaction, then I put great or number six, it will show up in, these, in this transaction. I'm going to jump over here to the menu section, and on the menu, you have immediately you have your available balance, and you also have the things that you can do with the app. And for me, and for a lot of people, it's frustrating when they need their routing and their account number, and it's hard to find or hard to remember, uh, especially if you are not used to having a bank account. So we made the routing and uh, account number available right from the menu, so you can always you always have access to it. The other thing that we did is we added the ability to do transfers, real-time transfers within the bank. So if you're using Refunder, you can also transfer money between users, and that's done instantly at no cost. So you can see which ones of your contacts have uh, a bank account at Refunder, and you can see how much money you want to send them. You enter your PIN number for your card, and then you write a note. Thanks for coffee. And you would submit this transaction, and Daphne would immediately get $25. Obviously, I don't have $25, I had $1. And that would appear like that. Daphne would be able to send me money uh, because she owes me money because I had to pay for parking to get here. And I would get a push notification on my phone. I turned it on. And soon I will get a push notification. Maybe it won't get yeah, first notification. I'm going to move, over, move on. Uh, so I have my transfers. Uh, we partnered with, we partnered with, uh, right now we have four banking partners that help us stay in compliance, make sure the money stays FDIC insured from end to end. And we, we also partnered with Western Union. Remember, we're dealing with people who primarily work with cash. So we partnered with Western Union, and you can go to any one of the Western Union locations. It's 40,000 of them in the United States, and you can deposit cash. Uh, there, they charge a small fee, $3.95. You can deposit up to $1,700 per day. And so you have your, your, your cash deposit option here. Uh, and anywhere you go, you'll be able to find where those Western Unions are located. 
Uh, we have uh, check deposit. We have added it for a new for a new version. I don't have it on this on this build. Uh, you can take a picture of the check, and it gets added into your bank account in about three to five days. The cool thing about this is that the, is that we're adding the ability to deposit checks into any bank account. So if you have another bank account that you want to that want that you want to support remote deposit capture, like your small community bank or maybe your big bank, you can take a picture of that check and we can deposit those funds into a bank account that does not support remote deposit capture. So you can take a picture here and, and take, uh, the money will end up in Bank of America. Uh, just one last thing I want to show you guys is here in settings. To me and you who have bank accounts, it's very normal for us to have alerts regarding uh, when you have a low balance or when a bill is due or when a bill has to be paid. The other bank don't have that option. Out of the four main banks in the United States who all have apps, do you know how many of them make that app available in a language other than English? None. Not even Spanish is available for these people. Uh, and we think that we are uniquely qualified to help them because we come from these communities. So we understand these communities. Uh, we understand these people. We are these people. And that's important for us is to continue to serve them with technology. And I think that that's the only way that we're going to uh, be able to get them out of uh, being underserved. And that's all I got. Thank you guys for sharing. Yes. Hey, so I, I used to work here at AOL, and now I work actually on the mobile team of one of those four big banks that are bad. Uh, <laughs> They're not bad. I, I, I won't tell you which one I work for. Them. But in any case, so I've learned a lot in the past year about banking, as to you guys. But one of the things I've learned about sort of compliance and regulation and risk and all those things. So how do you deal with you know your customer regulations Especially since a lot of those people that are underbanked are underbanked because they don't have documentation. So how do you deal with KYC and, and those regulations in terms of getting those people that have these bank accounts? Especially since today you heard in the news that some you know, some bank or something that's doing money exchange by by check down like that. So KYC means know your customer and its regulation under the US Patriot Act that you have to know who your customer is and you have to have that documentation. And that has been uh, one of the things that we pride ourselves on, is being able to take something so complex and make it so simple that you can open up a bank account and write on your phone. Uh, so we comply fully with KYC. Uh, we use third-party databases. We also use the OPAC list to make sure that anybody who we're opening a bank account for does not uh, fall under these, under these lists and they fall 100% they within compliance of our program. Um, regarding people that don't have documentation, that doesn't mean that they are on no fact list or that they can't, they're not allowed to open up a bank account. So you can open up a bank account with us if you have a social security number or if you have an ITIN number, which is an individual taxpayer identification number, usually assigned to people who don't have legal status in the United States but are still paying their taxes here in the US. Uh, and you can open up a bank account with either one of those uh, identifications. How do you verify the fact that, you know, so we use either Matricula Consulat from Mexico, if they are Mexican, we're also adding some additional uh, identifications or additional passports from foreign country. Our goal, our number one goal is to make sure that they're not an OFAC. Uh, make sure that these people don't have, uh, they're not on Interpol, they're, they're, they're not, they're, their funds are not supposed to be seized. And we can verify the validity of these, of these identifications regardless if they're foreign. In the back. Do you maintain your own infrastructure or do you leverage Amazon and all? Because, uh, you know, something like this requires a lot of infrastructure if you're hosting these accounts and you're replicating and, uh, you know, making the databases secure and uh, all, all that stuff. So all the, uh, it, it requires a very robust backend. So do you so do that yourself? So we partner with Rackspace uh, to be able to provide PCI compliance and PCI compliant data, data warehousing. Uh, even though we're not storing any card data on our end, uh, we still we, we still decided we were going to go with PCI compliance to make sure that it's uh, fully secure and uh, compliant. So, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. So, what are the uh, what are the banks that you work with? I mean, typically they they charge a fee if you don't keep a certain balance. Now, I'm assuming that a lot of these guys have some experience, with, you know, dealing with. People who live on, you know, who live on, you know, basically one question, doing the money to get out. Um, 
So we've managed to turn an unprofitable segment, a traditionally unprofitable segment, into a profitable segment. And the way that we do that is by giving access to people, to people's money and access uh, outside of branches. So we partner with our banks to make sure that the fees that are incurred are paid by us, but we're able to recuperate them from the customer spending. So the customer pays $5 a month to have an account. If he get, deposits over $500 into his account, those $5 are waived. And then we also partner with a, with a network called MoneyPass. They have 20,000 ATMs nationwide, and they don't charge a cent for ATM withdrawals. If you use an ATM outside of our network, we charge a dollar, and we think that's fair. Uh, and we're able to be profitable with these uh, small margins, but we're able to convert an unprofitable segment into a profitable one. sensitive information that we're really storing on, on the phone would be the routing and account number, which is already on most people's checks and mail through US postal mail, which we know is not the most secure. Uh, so other than that, we're not storing any card numbers on there, we're not storing your social security number on there, we're not storing your personal personal identifiable information on there. Uh, so but other than that, I still need to Oh, sorry. Um, I saw that on the website that your app is available on the um, App Store. That's right. And I'm wondering if you have it available on other pla platforms, as I, I assume other bank people do not mainly have iPhones. Uh, which is a stereotype, right? They say mostly under bank people don't have iPhones. It's not necessarily a fact. But to answer your question, currently it is only available on iPhone. We are rolling out the Android version later this year. Uh, iPhones can now be purchased for a dollar. What is the rate of like, that big population? What kind of do they have? Smartphones. So it's one of the largest growing segments of smartphones now. Right? Smartphones basically are free. A lot of Android phones are free, a lot of iPhones are just a dollar. But it sounds like so far you think that it's not, that it is not free iPhone? No, I'm not saying it's mostly iPhone. I'm saying that price point is on par with a lot of Android phones. The difference is only 100%. <coughs> it's traditionally been Android because they hit the market first with free free phones uh, or low cost phones. I think that now it's starting to it's starting to even out because like I said, the iPhones, especially Apple 4 and 4s, are, are low cost. And it's not just I mean it's not just the price. Like they, they are available on a broader range of platforms. Is that what you're saying? On more platforms, T-Mobile just brought up so. Yeah. It's a debit card, it's a prepaid debit card. Uh, so the risk that the banks and us take is very minimal because they can never overspend more than the amount of money that they have in their account, which is very similar to my bank account, right? I can only spend as much as I have. If I do, I pay hefty fees and penalties. And the goal is to not trap them into that. So if they don't have enough funds, uh, for example, this is just a quick example. If their bill is $35 and they only have $20 on their card, if they go and they swipe their card, we will take the twenty dollars and tell the merchant, "Here's twenty. Ask them if they have another fifteen or cancel the transaction." So we do allow them to zero out their account entirely. So who issues the card? So the card right now is issued to two banks. Uh, one bank is called First Bank and Trust out of South Dakota. Another bank is called uh, University National Bank out of Minnesota. And are they the ones also who are they are the ones that are holding the deposits in FDSU, FDSC insured accounts. Yeah, we don't handle any of the money. Um, we need to move on to the last demo. But we'll be here. Um, on the yeah, so if anybody you. has a question, you can download the app and open up the bank account while the next guy's present. Very interesting. Thank you, Roger. Um, okay, and so wrapping up the night is Steve from Movable Media. Movable Feast, the Hemingway, based on Movable Feast, the Hemingway um, title. And this is actually um, kind of a blast from the past. So a little over two years ago, Steve presented um, 
Yeah, yeah. Um, this mobile app, and it's a way for people to kind of capture the media from the tours that they do, from the walks that they do, or the experiences they have. Is that a, the right way to say? Or maybe I should turn it over to you, and no. you can. Yeah, you probably know a lot about it. <laughs> well, the, so, uh, what? Can you, in the back, can you hear me if I talk like this? Yeah. 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 No. Can I forego the mic? No. Okay. <laughs> so, I'm Steve Schultz. I'm the founder of Movable Piece Mobile Media. And it's a platform for 4D storytelling. Um, I'm sure you're going to ask me what 4D storytelling means, and I'll be happy to tell you. But let me just get right into this uh, demo piece. Like she said, I, I have presented this before, so I'm going to kind of go really, really fast. I've already put together something. In my idea, this is a really kind of uh, basic execution of my idea, which is to kind of overlay a storytelling layer on top of a pub call and make it something that's much more interesting than just going from place to place and seeing how much you can drink in a short period of time. It may also be interesting to uh, brands as a sponsorship. So I had this idea to take the, the uh, best New York City cocktails 2012, according to Tasting Table, and put it together in my app. And I've actually already added all five of them. And what I'm going to do really quick, just to show you how the whole thing works, is uh, I'm going to add another stop. And this, one, this stop's going to be for food, to kind of make the, the tour less about getting drunk and more about the story that's involved. So what I'll do is, I've already laid out the route. You can see that the route's already here. And most of them, it starts on the Upper East Side, but most of the other bars that have these great cocktails are in the East Village. So I decided to add, um, Thank you. 
what we're now seeing people do is create conducive experiences that enable them to interact with brands that are not only uh, big national brands like Diageo, which is trying to create for this now, but also local brands, local stores, uh, and, and making that in the context of an actual store. So for example, you know, Playwright, who's using story looks like this. He actually wrote a play. It's a narrative. And it has fictional characters going to real places in Park Slope. And when you get there, as a ticket holder to this play, you actually get deals at that place while you're engaging in the story itself. So um, we, we see people starting to use it like that. We see filmmakers using it. And, and, and really well. But I think, you know, I, I wish that, that we would have users that actually went on this a ticket holder to this, to this play and said, getting to walk around in the character's shoes really gives you a new sense of this story. And for us, I think that, that's, that really sums up everything that we're really trying to do. I kind of feel like bringing contextual relevancy back to media is a really, really powerful thing when you overlay it on top of location of this. And that's what we're really trying to do. So it's great when you said that for the first time and didn't have any 